have hope, guys. Always have hope. Uh, how's everybody doing? Excellent. Thank you so much for coming out. My name is Jarrett Weissman. I work for BuzzFeed. So the omen came true, and they all fell, one by friend, one by foe, and one by family. And they weren't alone. It was a season of loss on the originals, but the cast is here today. So please help me welcome to the stage Charles Michael Davis. <laughs> Phoebe Tonkin. <laughs> Executive producer Julie Pleck. <laughs> Joseph Morgan. <laughs> Keep it going for Daniel Gillies. <laughs> Executive producer, Michael Narducci. <laughs> Yusef Gatewood. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm so nervous. <laughs> and last but not least, making her Comic-Con debut, Riley Vocal. <laughs> Hello, guys. Give it up for the originals. <laughs> Thanks right. for being here today, guys. Uh, so, Joseph, I want to start with you. You know, oh dear. The <laughs> Sorry, I don't. The the season really culminated in a huge sacrifice on Klaus's part. This is a man who, in the past, has been accused of being selfish, maybe a little self-serving at times, and this was a truly selfless act on his part. I was wondering what you made of his decision to sort of take the brunt of this torture for his family. You know, I, I, I thought it was pretty heroic. Daniel was saying to me the other day how it's heroic not true. he thought it was. I didn't think it was. <laughs> uh, you, you know, and, and sort of art imitating life, you know, just kind of <laughs> playing the hero. It's not what um, happened. It, it wasn't the conversation. It is what people have been saying. Well, uh, <laughs> let's agree to disagree. I thought it was, uh, I thought it was a nice turn of events. I, I, I thought it's about time that he uh, put his family first instead of putting them in coffins. So, yeah. <laughs> Still, it still happened. It still happened. Still exactly. happened. Uh, Let's just focus on the heroic part. <laughs> of the connection, please. I mean, Daniel, I'm curious what you think you know, Elijah's opinion of the situation is because you know they've always you know they're very unconscious. I think right. Now. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, they've always had you know this kind of tumultuous relationship, and this really is a moment where he'll see his brother put the him put the family first. What do you think he'll make of that? Yeah, I mean, it, it was, it was short-lived, his, his uh, ability to experience that selflessness, I can't believe I'm <laughs> saying that, from, from Klaus, but I think it's going to be interesting to see uh, his reaction to it when he, when he emerges, because it has, it has altered the status quo, that, that sacrificial element of Klaus. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm just as curious as you are. Well, Michael, uh, I'm wondering what you and the writers wanted to sort of say with that moment. What did, what did you think that gave Klaus as a character to have him make this sacrifice? Um, <clears throat> you know, I think all season long, uh, one of the things we were talking about is how these people will do anything for family. And I think Klaus is someone who loves his family and often has thought of himself as the center of their universe and thinks of them as revolving around him. And as long as they are here to service him, he's happy. And when they disobey him, he sticks them in a coffin, and that's <laughs> fine. And wakes them up when he wants to give them another chance. Um, and part of our vision for this entire series was to explore how that person might, after a thousand years, change. And I think we saw uh, a lot of things. The birth of his daughter, uh, his relationship expanding with his brother, um, you know, this, very strange relationship he has with the woman uh, who he has this child with, and also this relationship he had with this therapist who he fell in love with. And so all of these things combined, his relationship with his parents who came back from the dead, his real father, Ansel, all these things combined um, to uh, change Klaus and make him the person who, at this point, at the end of our season three, would do what he did. And I really can't wait to see if he's going to continue on that 
journey or if he's going to take steps backward. And I think it's oh, interesting sorry. to <laughs> Excuse me. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you okay? Fine. Uh, Hey, I'm curious, Phoebe, what you think about uh, Haley is someone who historically has been alone. I mean, it's been such a huge part of her storyline for years and years she was alone. I mean, yes, technically she has the bodies of her loved one in the back of a big rig as she travels across the country with her daughter. <laughs> but I mean, Kinky. Do you, <laughs> does she feel alone again or do you think she feels like empowered and on a mission and there's a purpose for that loneliness? You know, I think um, when we met Haley, all she ever wanted was family. Um, and through the events that happened, um, she kind of created family on her own through her daughter. And, and I think her daughter has become that family. Um, but yeah, I think that, I don't think she feels alone, one, because she has five bodies in the back of her car, um, and, and two, because yeah, she, she has purpose, mm -hmm. and it's a family-driven purpose, which is all she's ever wanted in her life. So, yeah, I think that that's enough for her right now. <laughs> I mean, speaking of hope, we saw the back of her head. She is clearly older when the show picks up. Uh, what can you get, what can, Mike, Julie, what can you say about what, how much time has passed when the new season starts? Um, it's a substantial amount of time. I mean, we're, she was two years old when we uh, left her uh, and her mom going on that cross-country journey to wherever. And as you saw uh, in the teaser, she's, she's now a little person. You know, she's got uh, dialogue and hopes and dreams, and she misses her dad, and she understands that her family has suffered a terrible loss. And at the same time, she feels very connected to her mom, and I believe Haley is a great mom who has, managed to, uh, <laughs> <laughs> who has managed to not only protect and educate and safeguard and defend her child, but to also keep uh, hidden from Klaus's enemies and to protect the family of unconscious Michelson siblings who could easily be captured and thrown into the bottom of the ocean by... Are you doing all this to avoid saying how many years have passed? Yeah, yeah. just give us a number, it's dude. Five. Like, just say About five years. <laughs> Thank five, you. Years. <laughs> five years. This is what happens in the writer's room, and this is why we're always there. <laughs> five years. Five years. What, I mean, what can you say about where Haley is going for this help? You know, she obviously needs to prevent them from staying unconscious for the next, what, six seasons, seven seasons? So, I mean, where is Haley off to, Mike? It really comes down to Haley saving the family. And uh, what we did at the end of season three was hint at the possibility that the way to cure this bite that now Elijah and Cole are suffering from and the way to uh, cure Rebecca and the way to cure Freya from this poison it's, it all comes down to Haley, and the first thing she's got to do is locate the seven werewolf packs. And they're spread out all over the place and probably hunted to death by, by Lucian Castle. And uh, so she's got a very difficult journey ahead of her, and she's going to have to explore that side of her, the werewolf side, that you know, would connect her to those packs. So werewolves probably wouldn't be so stoked about helping someone raise the most dangerous vampires that ever lived. So how does she navigate that dilemma? Well, luckily, there's a equally dangerous person still hanging out in New Orleans ah. this whole time. <laughs> several, uh, <laughs> several dangerous people. Still That's here. right. Uh, I'm curious, I mean, what did you think, Charles, about Marcel's decision in the finale to sort of really exact vengeance in such an intense way? I thought he, I thought he could have gone further. I thought he could have killed him. <laughs> I, th I think he, yeah, right? Yeah. So I think he was um, kind, um, heroic comes to mind. Nobody's saying that. Nobody. <laughs> I, I, I heard the word heroic thrown around, and I, I assumed they were talking about me and my character <laughs> to describe the, the question that, that you're asking. Um, heroic would be is my answer. I'm going to go with heroic. Okay. I like what that. was the question anyway? Nailed it. Nailed it. You did so good. You did okay. so good. Uh, but I'm curious. I mean, you know, a lot of, I asked the fans for questions on Twitter, and a lot of them had the same one, which was, does this make Marcel next season's big bad. Yeah, I think what they're asking is, is Marcel gonna die next season is really the root of the question. <laughs> to that I say, well, no. You're again. Yeah, yeah. 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 I'm the Mike, people's princess. Wait, <laughs> say, yeah, the, king, the people's princess. <laughs> um, does it make me the big bad? I don't, I don't know, that's a question I'm a actually wondering. Let's throw it, Julie, let's throw it down the row. Again, to the yeah. Mr. Narducci. Well, the best advice I ever got about writing is that good writing is two people on stage and they're arguing and they're both right, you know? So I don't think Marcel is the villain. I don't think he's wrong. 
Mm -hmm. I think he did what I would have done in those exact circumstances. And I think, I think the Michaelsons, <laughs> I think the Michaelsons did what kill I would have class, done in those exact class. circumstances. And it's, it's unfortunate that there's this terrible conflict between them. And now we have to see, is there anything in this world um, that might be able to mend those uh, you, relationships? I you know taken, what? I would have taken care of you, Joe. I would have, I would have. Right. I would have coddled you. I would have hugged you. I would have made you feel good oh, about yourself. On. But it's a I'm lingering also, like, fantasy in that wildly codependent. The shit out of <laughs> <laughs> let's let's settle this now. Show of hands. Who wants Marcel to be king? I want to. King. I, mm. <laughs> oh. <laughs> betrayed. <laughs> <laughs> betrayed by the mob. All right. All right. Show of hands for Klaus. <laughs> Everybody out, there's the exit. Uh, <laughs> the five of you who raised your hands for Marcel, please stay. <laughs> Come to the front. There'll be hugs and you already know them. <laughs> kisses afterwards. <laughs> but I mean, you know, Marcel's not gonna operate sort of unchecked. I think Vincent really sort of in the finale talked about like, I got my eye on you. I see what you're doing and I see what's up. And Yusuf, I mean, what do you like about sort of him operating from this place of like, I'm gonna keep my eye on you and make sure you don't overstep your bounds? Oh, well, um, I like, it, it's, a, it's a city that has checks and balances now. Um, I, I, these guys are working together, uh, and I think they have a common goal. They're approaching it from different directions. Um, they have different motivations. But uh, at, the, at the root of all of it, they, they want uh, to see New Orleans protected and the people of New Orleans protected. Um, and I think it's going to be interesting to explore that relationship, not necessarily a friendship, but um, working together towards something. Um, a, a common goal. I mean, Vincent is still very much a mystery to us, you know, who he was. Me too. <laughs> Are we going to get to sort of explore, Mike, some of his backstory this year and sort of see where this man came from? I, th I, th no. I think we might have an opportunity. I mean, Mike knows much more than I do, but I feel like we might have an opportunity to see uh, uh, where this guy comes from a little bit, sure. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we, we have stuff coming up uh, and you know, I'm so excited to write for someone like Yusuf because I know he can do anything and he makes it so beautiful and authentic. Um, and we're going to put his character through the ringer this year. And it's going to be, uh, you know, awesome and challenging. Um, but we're going to see why this character is so closely tied to New Orleans and why, you know, he would stand uh, for his city, even if that forced him to kind of make a deal with the devil. So there were many devils or family of devils, if you will. <laughs> Uh, speaking of getting put through the ringer, Riley, I feel like Freya came in and instantly was like, oh, I'm going to do 17,000 spells every week and almost die yeah. and bleed from orifices. <laughs> Story of her life. I mean, it's a little bit of trial by fire. I mean, what did you enjoy about what she got to do this season? I mean, I just, I love how much she loves her family. She had such a terrible upbringing and then she finally found them and the fact that they finally accepted her and that she can fight for them. Um, I relate to that personally, so I really love that part about her. She'll do anything for them. Absolutely. This season also sort of brought a storyline that I think a lot of fans were very excited to see the relationship between Haley and Elijah you, you waking up in bed together in the finale. Oi, oi. I mean, <laughs> Julia, I'll ask, why do you think now, wh why was that point the time to sort of move that storyline forward? Uh, um, you know, it's something that there's no recipe for how long to take a, a relationship how to you know start the stew and simmer it and add the spices you, you kind of have to like my aunt kathy you kind of have to like, cook it the way it feels and follow <laughs> this allegory is going to go on way too long <laughs> point being that i think with Haley and elijah we felt like they'd been sort of they'd gotten to dance around each other early on uh, and then come together and then just had to be kind of terribly separated emotionally and 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 physically and all those things, and to be able to, knowing that this family was going to be split apart for the next five years, um, give them the ability to consummate it again, you know, um, to declare love, to make plans for the future, to feel good in spite of the bad. It just felt like time, you know, and, and time will tell how much happiness they'll be able to have or not have it as is. things happen, <laughs> as they do. I mean, those were some great scenes uh, between the two that you got to play with both Daniel and Joseph this season, Phoebe. I'm curious. I mean, those scenes, I think, across, like, the corridor, you know, when you're having conversations. I mean, what did you like about sort of how the two different worlds she got to experience with these guys? You mean, like, the two brothers? 
<laughs> I just mean these two powerful forces in her life. Oh, I see. Um, yeah, I think it creates a really interesting, very kind of strange dynamic. Um, it's kind of a very modern family, <laughs> if you think about it. <laughs> um, baby daddy is, you know, boyfriend's brother. Um, but yeah, you know, I just, I think that Haley is also trying to find her voice between these two very powerful men in her life. Um, one who is a father of her kid and one who she's romantic with. And uh, Michael and I worked, uh, talked about it. And I think that now that we all know five years have passed, you know, I think that having not been with them for the last five years and she's had to, you know, five years is a long time and she's been on this mission to, to, to get them out of this situation that they're in. And I think she's probably taken on a few of the qualities that she picked up from Klaus and Elijah, um, which I think is something that we're going to really try and play with this season, hopefully. <laughs> um, because, yeah, I think, I think definitely she's learned stuff from them and the way to kind of use their powers in a certain way and demand respect. And I think those are, you know, things that she's picked up from them. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there was, as much as there was coming together, there was also sort of some stepping apart in season four. Uh, there were some tough losses, you know, with Cammy and with Davina. Uh, and I'm curious, Joseph, I mean, for you, those scenes that you and Leah shared were really incredible. I mean, it's the end sort of of Cammy's journey was so gave so many opportunities for really amazing acting. I'm curious for you what it was like to sort of bring that experience to life on the show. Oh, that was a great episode. Um, it was pretty much a full day of shooting in a location which is quite far from our stages and just me and Leah there for the whole day. So it was, um, yeah, it was emotional, man. I mean, you know, she'd been a part of the show for three years. It was, it was kind of surreal, though. I don't think, until she was gone, I didn't really sort of think she was going, you know what I mean? Like We miss like, you, oh, Leah oh, and about. Danielle. Yeah, should we give it up for, I mean, those yeah. performances that they gave in their episodes were amazing. <laughs> amazing. Um, I mean, Julie, can you talk, I mean, those were hard choices, I'm sure, for the writers to make. Can you talk about sort of why those were necessary choices? Yeah, you know, it's, it's a... <laughs> It's a hard thing to explain uh, unless you're kind of in the room and, and breaking 22 episodes of story every year for years upon years. And you get to a point, and we reach this point in Vampire Diaries as well, where you start to feel um, a redundancy of heroes and where you start to feel like if you, if you go down, a, if you continue down a, a certain storyline, then you will end up taking people in a direction that will isolate them and then you'll only ever be telling those stories and you just want to, you get the urge to mix things up and to make things very tragic and to kill people and to say goodbye so that you can, con uh, you can always feel fresh and so that you don't have nine people ultimately telling the same story in their own way. Um, we really knew that we needed to get back to with a big time jump coming <clears throat> one, you know, um, with in Davina's case, someone who wouldn't couldn't age, you know, <laughs> come back with her in five more years, but we needed to pull the family together as tight as possible, and in doing so, needed to sadly excise some of the characters that, that, might, um, that might conflict with our desire to be as tight in the pocket of the family as possible. So, and it's especially hard when you have actresses um, like those girls, and you know, and Leah is, is specifically is a tremendous, powerful, talented actor, uh, and so you're like, oh, what are we doing here? But I, I think ultimately, in the way that the show will move forward, that it will have served the show beautifully, even though we will miss um, both of them desperately. <laughs> yeah, I think one thing I would just like to add is. I think the job of good movies and good TV shows and good books is to make us care and to evoke emotion and to evoke empathy. And I think right now that's something we need in this world. We're not caring enough about one another. We don't care about the hardships that people are going through or the suffering that people are going through. And I think part of the job of good literature and good cinema and good TV is to make you care. And someone who is not real and did not experience any real suffering, like Leah's great. She's an awesome actress, she's gonna be fine. Cammy is not real. She didn't really die. It's, it's fiction. It's something you watch. And then 
I hope you do cry. And then I hope you turn to the person next to you and you talk about life and death and it informs your life. And that's what we're all trying to do. So that's, that's what's going on. That was beautiful. Yeah. That was really beautiful. And with you know, that, I would love to open it up to your guys' questions. I believe there's a microphone right over here. So if you just, there you go. I think they're just going to screen it. And I think we have our first question. Wait, what number is it? Uh -huh. I don't. Do we? Sorry. Great. Hi. Oh. Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you. This season was absolutely wonderful, and I'll be waited, waiting with bated breath for January. Uh, my question is for everyone on the panel. Uh, for the showrunners, what was the most harrowing scene to write this last season, season three? And for the actors, what was the most harrowing, difficult scene to shoot? You guys had quite a few this year. Well, piggybacking on what Michael was just saying about the episode where Cammy dies, <clears throat> that was something he was very excited to write and also very nervous to write because when you're digging that deep as a writer, it's you know it can really eat at your soul. And I put him through the ringer purposely um, and, and, and possibly a bit cruelly because he would say this is the story and here's how it's going to go and I would say if, if you are not on the floor of your office or your room sobbing, curled up in a little ball as you write these scenes then you have not done your job yet and so I really pushed him to get to that point where he could get ugly with it and I think that that showed up on the screen he really gave everything he had in his heart and his soul and it was not easy and it was not fun uh, but it was beautiful yeah I just want to say I, I thank you Julie for doing that I co-wrote that episode with a great writer named Celeste Vasquez and she was awesome the whole way through and um, she's right over there yeah uh, hi Celeste <laughs> and um, I remember working on it with her, and, and uh, it absolutely wrecked us both, uh, and cried. And I, I think that's one of the pieces of writing that I'm most proud of in, in all the time that I've been doing this. And for me also, watching the scenes, the dailies, and uh, watching the scenes where Davina meets her end, um, or actually is sacrificed by Freya in episode 20, uh, that was devastating as well. Yeah. So. And the actors? That was definitely my hardest uh, moment was killing Davina because um, I was so involved. And I think Freya really did care about her and it wasn't something she wanted to do. It was something she had to do to save her brother. So that was hard. It was hard shooting it as well, especially with Danielle. <laughs> yeah, you know, for me, the, the, the probably the most harrowing scene to shoot was the, the trial in, in the finale because... Uh, you know, I play a character who's not often afraid for his life, but to kind of, just to come into a room full of people, you know, screaming, kill him, kill him, and that the whole, the whole trial, the energy in that room was, was crazy. We shot for about two days, and it was, um, it was intense, you know, when they lifted me up and they pulled me across, and Charles made that speech. It was pretty emotional. I, I felt like a, a weird energy from that scene. It was, um, mm. it was intense. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Yeah. Next question. Oh. Oh, unless you wanted to answer oh. anything, I'm sorry. Yeah, we can all. So I follow Daniel and Joseph on Instagram, and I really like your promotional Friday videos. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like you guys have a bunch of fun on set. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, who's the biggest prankster on set, and what was the best prank pit played? <laughs> Daniel. Joseph Morgan yeah, can field this one. Go to Gillies. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, we could go through the motions of me telling you about how Daniel's the biggest prankster and how one time the prank went too far and he ended up scratching my car and then he had yeah. to pay. For <laughs> but we've all heard that story. We won't. Before. We won't do that. Yeah. He came in really shamefully. There's like, not, And I didn't believe shame, him. And then he was a shame. I was, I was a little <laughs> shame. Uh, uh, probably he, he's probably the the biggest prankster. I just y use Instagram as a tool to, to mock and humiliate him, but I wouldn't say that's prank. Sure. <laughs> you know, got a lot of followers, so jokes on him. Yeah, I'm just. He uses <laughs> very random props all the time too in the scenes, which is always interesting. Oh yeah, yeah, I like that the prop challenge. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, actually, to answer that question that the, the, the lady asked earlier about. Um, like what's the most difficult scene to shoot? I honestly feel like every scene for me is the most difficult scene to shoot <laughs> because uh, um, what, what we do, you know, 
it's outlandish and it's so heightened the the the, the world we live in and it's and, and often the stakes are so high within any of the given scenes so you, you know naturally whenever there's tremendous solemnity or gravity within a scene you, you i my natural instinct is to to, to find as much funny as possible because it, well, it just it just always emerges you know i feel like it it, it's kind of like when I was a kid in church, you know, I, was, I just found it so hilarious that we were all in this place where everybody was trying to do this thing in earnest, you know? And uh, I don't know. <laughs> have, I do. have I successfully tell, tell offended everybody more. in here? <laughs> I don't know. I feel, I, feel, I, feel, I feel like every scene is, is super difficult because, uh, like, the, and, and the more earnest we become or the more we devote ourselves to the, uh, to, to the task at hand, the more I just think it's, a, it's ridiculous. And I piss everybody <laughs> off. I think what's great about that is part of what our show is about is the fragility of, of humanity. And one defense mechanism for that is a sense of humor. And we bring that, I think, with our actors all the time. So we're very fortunate to have jokesters. I, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Next question. Hi, I'm Danielle. Uh, Joseph and Daniel, you guys slay. <laughs> <laughs> like Santa's slay, right? <laughs> Reindeer and... No, like you guys are awesome. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, Daniel, how does it feel not to be wearing a suit? Ah. Oh, you mean right now? I I'm wearing a suit underneath this. <laughs> Always. <laughs> I just had it tailored this morning. That's why I look overweight, not because I gained any pounds. <laughs> over there. <You> know? <laughs> But uh, I, 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 look, I love wearing those suits in, in, in the show, too. I actually I find it incredibly gratifying to be able to wear the wardrobe that I do. I mean, Elijah's a Halloween costume. He's, he's awesome. Uh, but how does it feel to not be? Uh, I'm looking forward to the suits again, to be honest. <laughs> look at me, I'm a fucking mess. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Hello. So I've been following the originals since they made their debut in The Vampire Diaries, and I'm just wondering, where's Klaus's love life going? Is Caroline Forbes, is she making a comeback? <laughs> I, I know the answer to this, but I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> No, I, I, I don't know. What do you think, Jules? <laughs> you see that? I have, I have my own plans. I haven't shared them with anybody, though. Oh, so really? One day I just might drop it on y'all and let, let half of you kill me. <laughs> but um, we'll see. We shall Either see. Either way, half of you are going to be angry. I Either way, know. some of you will be pissed. Yeah. Some of you will be thrilled. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Hi, I'm Camry. Um, this question is for Joseph. I wanted to know, since Klaus has feelings for Cammy, if he still had feelings for Caroline. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think he has feelings he, he, for uh, both of them, and and for Aurora as well, probably for Haley, Genevieve, uh, Genevieve. for Genevieve, for yeah. Charles, Marcel, possibly <laughs> inappropriately for Freya. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and a little bit Papa Tunde, if we're, we're, we're honest. No, well, we're there. A thousand years old, who knows? Yeah, I mean. Uh, yeah, no, I think he, there's, a, there's a place in his cold, dark heart for all of them. Thank yeah. you for asking. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I believe that was our last question. So let me end the panel with this. I mean, Mike, I'm going to come to you. What are you excited for the show to explore next season now that you have this? time jump, you have all these opportunities to sort of play out new relationships. What should the fans be excited about when the show comes back in mid-season? So every year we kind of took as a central idea one thing and built our season around it. In season one, we wanted to do kind of Sopranos meets Interview with a Vampire. And in season two, we wanted to do kind of, and that Julie's idea was to do the darkest, most messed up fairy tale that we could possibly tell. And there was elements of there were elements of you know, Hansel and Gretel and Sleeping Beauty and Freya's Return and Dahlia the Evil, Wicked Aunt, you know, all these things. In season three, and I know this sounds ambitious, but you gotta aim high and hope that you can at least do okay, but we really wanted to write a proper like Shakespearean tragedy. 
Uh, and I think with the prophecy, as you see in Macbeth, and you know, Lucian as a kind of Iago character whispering in Klaus's ear, you know, there are all these different things that we try to accomplish. In season four, uh, our inspiration is a combination of kind of the darkest and most messed up elements of the Bible, and uh, my favorite novelist, probably Stephen King. And um, we are going to tell a rip-roaring, very scary New Orleans ghost story. And um, at the center of that will be these people who are fighting to figure out who they even are after a thousand years of murder and mayhem and kind of disgust with themselves and their family bond that just leads to, as Haley put it in episode 311, loving any one of us is a death sentence. So is there any possibility of redemption for these monsters? And, and I think maybe the answer to that is maybe if they have to face something that's even worse than them. And that's the story I'm really fired up to tell. What are those little books on your... That's beautiful. What are, that's gorgeous. Yeah, that's great. Awesome. What are your little that's books there, Narduch? What's that? What are your little books? Oh, I brought copies of The Art of War, which oh. is Klaus's favorite book. Uh, you see Klaus reading it in episode 202. You see Cammie reading it to bone up for her possible war with Aurora, uh, and I have a few copies. I thought I'd just hand them out to anybody who wants one after this. <laughs> awesome. Well, with that said, guys, thank you so much for coming out today. Give it up for the cast and for the originals. Thank you. thank you, guys.